Hey friends, uh, my name is Father Anthony Ferguson, and uh, this is another episode of These Are a Few of My Favorite Books. Uh, so, what do I got today? Let's see. This is a book that maybe you've never heard of before. It's a little bit, uh, I'd never heard of it before I read it, which is usually the case, right? <laughs> All right, so this is the book for today. The Bishop of the Abandoned Tabernacle. Uh, and this is uh, written by Victoria Schneider, but it's building off of a lot of the writings and the, the spirituality of this man who's named St. Manuel Gonzalez Garcia. Um, he's, he's a bishop, and he's the bishop of the abandoned tabernacle, apparently. So his story is a little bit like, uh, you may have remembered kind of the story of St. John Vianney, uh, the patron saint of parish priests, who, when he showed up to his parish, nobody cared, right? Nobody cared about God, nobody cared about faith, nobody cared about prayer, and St. John Vianney just, like, came in and basically just wept over his people and, and knelt down, prayed all night long, and interceded for this incredibly apathetic and uh, just unenthused community. And look at what happened with him. There, this incredible fruitfulness came, right? Like, uh, within years of his ministry in Ars, France, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of pilgrims were coming to his tiny little country parish uh, in order to have him hear their confession. So, uh, something similar kind of happened with this guy, St. Manuel Gonzalez Garcia. He showed up to his parish assignment and uh, there's this really, really beautiful story in this book about how he shows up, the church is in shambles. Uh, the, the tabernacle is covered with cobwebs, like literally covered with cobwebs. It's like nobody's used this place. Nobody has visited the Lord in the tabernacle. Um, he's, just, he's just abandoned. He's forgotten. And here comes St. Manuel Gonz uh, Gonzalez Garcia, uh, the bishop of the abandoned tabernacle, to come and spend time with the Lord, to, to pay him company, to attend to him. Uh, because nobody else was. Um, and so this bishop, this this priest, I think when he first showed up, he was just a priest. Um, he just intercedes for his people, just kind of like St. John Vianney did. He intercedes for his people, and, and he is present to the Lord even when they are not. Um, and just the power of that, the beauty of that, the sacrifice of that, um, of that adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Really, really cool book. Um, but the rest of, I mean... Yeah, there's that story, but the, the book in large part is just his conversations with the Lord uh, there in the tabernacle. Um, and so I'll, I'll share a few things that, that, that were impressed uh, into my heart when I read this book. Um, all right, so so this is this is this priest talking with the Lord, just, just sharing his heart with the Lord. And you, who do you say that I am? Holy Master, it is more than 20 centuries since you first opened your lips to ask this question. But during these centuries, not one day has passed that you have not repeated your question. Who do you say that I am? For the priests who serve at my altar, for the Christians who consume me in Holy Communion, and for those who come before my tabernacles, who am I? Lord, why do you ask the same question? And why do you ask precisely those who should know the answer best? Do not men respond to you, calling you Father, Christ, Son of the living God, Savior of the world, Master of all truth, Sacred Heart, God with us, Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist? Don't the choirs of cathedrals and monasteries, as well as the mouths of your priests and virgins, respond to you with praises and confessions in their masses and offices? Why, in spite of those responses, do you continue asking? All right, don't tell me. My heart has already guessed and feels it. It is our behavior towards you that is the cause of your insistence. It is the monumental discrepancy, I would say, between the responses of our lips and of our actions. Shame on us, for you cannot believe or trust in our word. If we call you Father... Why don't we love you as your children? If we say, Son of the living God, why don't we adore you above all things? And why do we treat you as if you were dead? If we proclaim you as Savior and Master of the world, why do we look for our well-being and truth in other ways aside from you? 
if you are the sacred heart, why don't we render our sinful hearts to you? If you are God with us and the Eucharist, why do we abandon the tabernacle and leave God with the cobwebs and mice? Whew. All right, I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to go spend some time with Jesus in the tabernacle. Just kidding. I'll, I'll go there soon, soon enough. But dang, isn't that intense? Like, holy moly. I mean, just if we say that God is God, then why don't we treat him as such? And that's why Jesus continues to ask us over and over and over down through 20 centuries, right? Who am I? Who do you say that I am? Uh, if I'm your Lord and Savior, then, then, then don't just say it, act like it. Uh, treat, come to me. Actually rely on me. Uh, that's what our Lord is saying to us over and over and over. Uh, so this book is chock full of stuff like that. Um, another really interesting uh, thing that I have underlined here, um, got my St. Francis of Assisi prayer card in here still. Uh, it says this, um, this is talking about kind of Jesus present in the tabernacle. Uh, the Lord in the tabernacle is so silent and still, it seems he doesn't ask for more than our silent adoration. Nevertheless, I tell you that there is no place on earth with activity more fruitful than that which is done in the tabernacle. Uh, I love that image. Um, it is not for the eye or the ear of the flesh to perceive these things, but for the ear and eye of the soul. With these attentive eyes and ears, we can listen to and see what is said and done in the tabernacle. Um, I think sometimes, uh, I mean, here, here's like my, my little pet peeve. Sometimes I see, I see Catholics come into parishes and they, they kind of genuflect, right, to they don't even know what, it seems. Uh, they genuflect as if to just kind of check into their pew, right? No matter what's in front of them, they genuflect to, towards the direction that the pew is going, right? Well, actually, genuflection, like the going down on one knee as we come into a church, is always pointing to where? But the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is where the real presence of Jesus is is dwelling in the Holy Eucharist, in the Blessed Sacrament, right? Um, we, we genuflect to the tabernacle because we know that it's not just, Jesus is not just a dead, silent, kind of like stagnant Blessed Sacrament, right? The, the hosts, even though they're perfectly still, perfectly silent, um, there's activity there. Jesus is active in the Blessed Sacrament. He's powerful in the Blessed Sacrament. Do we believe that? Do we stake our life on that? When we come into adoration, do we, do we believe that? I know sometimes I don't. I have a hard time believing that Jesus is actually active and real in the Blessed Sacrament. It's hard to see that, right? It's hard to, to understand that. But we believe in faith that it's true. That when he said, this is my body, this is my blood, uh, that, that he meant it. And, and when he said, like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life, that, that he meant it. Uh, so, so when we come in an adoration, and as St. Manuel Gonzalez Garcia so beautifully tells us and reveals for us, when we come to the Blessed Sacrament in adoration, in silent contemplation, then we know that it's not just us wasting time. It's not just us kind of sitting still and trying to, like, empty our minds, right? Like, kind of like a Zen Buddhist or something like that. Like the goal is to just kind of empty ourselves and be like, be nothing. No, that's not Christianity. I'm sorry, but that's just not Christianity. Christianity is a full and active, present silence. Uh, it's, it's being attentive to the Lord, being still before the Lord, right? The Psalms tell us that, be still and know that I am God. But here's the deal. When we are still and we know that God is God, then we can trust that God is active, that he is in the midst of our lives, that he's in the midst of the lives of our family and friends, that he's not just this stagnant, uh, abstract, distant thing that some people have time for and some people just don't. No, he is living and active and he's present in your life. Uh, so... I guess before this video gets a little too long, uh, check this book out. 
it's, it's a beautiful read. I read it over uh, my canonical retreat as I was preparing for my diaconate ordination. So that was back in 2019, I think. Uh, so I, I placed this before you. I picked this book up at Seek, which is a big, big time Catholic conference. Uh, and it's just, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, read. I recommend it. Uh, and, and I also exhort you, whoever's listening this long into the video, uh, to go visit Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, just go hang out with him uh, before the tabernacle. It is an active place. He will speak to your heart. Listen. Uh, trust that it's not up to you to, to have a good prayer, uh, a prayer time. It's not your, it's not like you have to like do all this hard work. You just have to prepare yourself. You just have to prepare the way of the Lord, just like like Advent keeps telling us to do. And he will come into your life. He will speak into your your situation, whatever you're going through. Uh, so God bless you guys. This is Father Anthony signing out from these are a few of my favorite books. Check it out. Take care. God bless you. And uh, get ready for Christmas. It's almost Christmas. Bye.